Okay, seems like we are live. Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, welcome to this second, or is it the, the last day of the conference? The stage is not right, it's not about my being. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for uh, coming to this session. Uh, the talk, as you see, the title is to Deploy or Not to Deploy, and decide using TTA. We'll hopefully get to learn a little bit more about this as we go on. A quick introduction about myself. I'm Anand Bagmar. Uh, I'm currently uh, playing the role of a test practice lead at ThoughtWorks. Uh, I've been with ThoughtWorks for close to five years now. Been in the testing field for 17, 18 years in various different forms of testing. And uh, I really love what I do. Uh, and I try to do more of that, so it helps me both ways. That said, enough about me. Quick question. How many of you were there in my session yesterday? Okay, so I'll excuse you guys if you fall asleep for a little bit because there are a couple of slides which are repeated, the concepts uh, which are very important uh, to be repeated in that sense. Though it's going to be a little more detailed in uh, certain aspects of it. Um, okay, that's it. What is it that you think you're going to be getting out of this session or you will be hearing about from this session? What does it mean to you when you have to deploy or not to deploy? What does it really mean? Okay, should we take it to the market or not? Holy Nirvana state, for sure. Uh, very right. Uh, no, sir, you were saying something. Yeah, I said this thing. Go or no go. Okay, go or no go. What we are going to do is break it down way further or to a very granular state to say how can a developer know if I can go to the next environment or not? Can I push in my code to the next environment or not? How can you take it from a test environment to another test environment or a UAT or a free prod or whatever of those environments before we get to the last stage of yes, we are good to go to production. We are good to go to the market. That is what we will be doing. What are the criteria for determining if you are ready to go or not? No bugs. Is it ever possible? Okay. But defects, yes. Uh, how many are available? Who going on? How many have been found, reported, fakes? Uh, those kind of things. What else? Is defects the only measure? Critical business conformity. What about critical business functionality? Okay. So is the product doing what was expected out of it or not? Something someone said earlier. Performance. Performance of Product performance, is it at the right performance uh, level or not? So let's expand that to say NFRs of sort, right? Security, uh, because each domain would have its own set of requirements, right? Anything else? Okay, so combination of uh, defects and requirements, those kind of things. If defects is a measure of can you go to production or not, stop testing, there's no defects. Maybe it's just a thought that came to my mind. Right? Sorry? Quality. Quality. Is it doing it right? Uh, is the right thing being done, right? Very fair. But how do you really determine these things? Scope has been met. Scope has been met. Uh, something we'll definitely not be talking about in that sense. But since it comes to the requirements of sort, right? Is it has the right product been built? Right? Quality is, is it has it been built right in that sense? Okay. So any other measures you would see? For all those who responded, what was the scale of your products that you are talking about? Are these small greenfield products or small apps, e-commerce sites of sort, uh, websites, is it enterprise applications? Enterprise applications? Okay. How difficult or easy is it to measure these kind of things to make a meaningful decision? Eventually at what point do you say, fine, these are the numbers, let's slash it. I know I'm ready to go live, I need to go live regardless of what happens. Okay? It's reality, unfortunate reality, but that is the case. There are certain things which can be measured, certain things cannot be measured. It is difficult to measure. What we are going to try and do is come up with more data point based approaches to hopefully help the teams to make a more informed decision 
can we go ahead or not? Okay. Organization objective. For those who were there yesterday, we know what those are. So you can take a 10 minutes snooze, or not 10 minutes, sorry, 10 seconds. Okay. What is an organization objective? Why, why is the organization in business? To make money, to provide value, right? To do that, what is required? You need to get out to the market to the user base in good time. Otherwise, it's of no use. So, money and value, right? It's how much money you have versus how much you can make, what value you provide. You're right. right? Sorry? Absolutely. None of this is going to be possible if the product is not of good quality. So, all these things work together, and only then can the organization's objectives be met. Okay? Now, another reality in organizations is. We are spread across the world for various reasons. There could be many more reasons that you can come up with uh, why it is the case. But it's a reality. Which adds much more complexity because if everyone ultimately, even if it is 500 people or 1000 people, for a particular enterprise sitting together in one massive warehouse type setting, it still becomes possible. But does it become effective? Not really. The challenges compound. The minute you start going, you put a wall in between, or cubicle for that matter, that's a wall in between immediately. It's not you know, from ceiling to floor, but it's a wall. It's a divide. We are used to working in silos in certain ways. So, one of the practices, there are many practices that organizations come up with, teams come up with, how to make this effective for them. One of the practices is test automation. Can everyone relate to this? Does it make sense? Why would this be a successful practice? Yes. You can calibrate the quality of the product. If you get to manage it with a lot of things, you can say with them, manage the way you want to. The solution was aiming at this one, which is definitely to the pulse and the quality of the product. Okay. So quick feedback, essentially, yeah. Consistent quality or consistent feedback? Yeah. Consistent feedback about quality, right? Someone was saying. Reduce manual error. Reduce manual uh, testing. Okay. Uh, repeated manual testing, rather. Does automation replace manual testing? Can it ever? Right. Is that a reason why? People are still comfortable with doing only manual testing, not moving to automation, because it cannot be replaced. It's a different topic. I'm sure Rahul Verma would be very happy to pick on that topic and add more uh, data points based on that. You need, you cannot just exist doing one thing or the other. Is what my opinion is. It is a very holistic view you need to take to do various things related with that aspect of quality. But regardless, that's not the topic here. Is so test automation? We all agree it's a good practice. It helps teams, right? What is one of the practices which can also make teams unsuccessful? There are many practices, right? Walls, for example, policies. It, uh, it stops, it prevents people from communicating better. What is one of the practices, other practices, that can make teams unsuccessful? Ignore bugs. Sorry? Ignore bugs and keep building software. Ignore bugs, keep building software. Like doing more testing for that matter. Okay. More working hours. Okay, let's talk more technical. This is a technical track, right? <laughs> but you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's also test automation. Why? Not built properly. Sorry. Coverage. Coverage is not sufficient. Okay. Fair. Blindly following results of automation. Assert true, true. Of course, my test is always going to pass. Right? Someone else was saying? High maintenance efforts. High maintenance efforts, of course. So, solution to that is build less code, write less code, less maintenance. It, it's reality. 
Then the more lines of code you add, the more chances of effects coming. Whether it's for product code or automation code, you just code after all, right? But the sense is, it is not built right. The, the right practices are not followed to build automation, it is not going to work. It will work for your first test, it will work up to your 10th test, it will start failing from your 15th test, for example. Right? As a result, what happens? Sorry? You have to uh, do that again. Instead of testing the product, you spend time fixing the automation. What else? Manual testing, what about manual testing? Yeah, you test the scripts again, but you don't test the product, which is uh, what the script should be testing. Yeah? Very fair, right? So we understand why it can be a good practice and why it can start becoming a bad practice also. In sense is, it is code. You have to treat it with the same respect as you would do for a product. It's a statement that has been made for a long time. How much do we really follow? Separate debate again. Okay? But what really is test automation then? Spoken about the pros and cons. What is test automation? Okay, that's a technical term. Now let's get to the business side of it also. What does it do? Reduce manual effort. What is the point of reducing a manual effort? Quicker feedback. Saving the time and eventually saving the money. Eventually, hopefully saving money, but yes, saving time for sure. <laughs> it's boring, which as a result becomes error for human nature, right? Doing the same task over and over again. Okay? So, automation is really a safety net for the product, right? I like to call it a safety net because the net by definition has got grids in it, right? There's a net size per se or whatever the terminology is, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a go fishing. But net has got some particular grid size. If a fisherman has to go and fish for small fish, you wouldn't go with a net having a very wide grid size. The fish are going to escape. If you need to catch big fish, if you go with a very small grid size net, you'll catch a lot of jump over there which you're not expecting or wanting. You have to filter out all a lot of that chaos. So it's very important to build a good safety net. And it's likewise for automation. Automation is a safety net. If you don't automate the right kind of test, issues will slip out. If you build it too fine grained, you will be caught in meaningless or very low severity, priority, trivial kind of things which may not be of value to you or to the business. Because at the end, organization objective, which you are part of, even though you may be working in a separate testing organization for whatever reasons, you still are aiming to deliver value. You have to have the right test identified and automated to provide value. Fair? So, how many of us have heard about the test automation pyramid? Okay, very few hands. Were you scratching your ears or you said yes? <laughs> so, very quick explanation about the test automation pyramid. This is a concept that was uh, introduced by Mike Cohn in uh, his book Succeeding with Agile, I don't know how many years ago. But Martin Fowler, one of the uh, signatories of the Agile Manifesto, has uh, blogged about it also in very nice, simple terms. What it says is a pyramid by definition is a triangle. The base is white, as you go to the top of the triangle, it keeps on narrowing, uh, narrowing and uh, converging. Based on the product that you are really testing, you would have various different types of tests that you would want to automate on that product to get effective and quick feedback to the team. These tests would, should start with unit tests and it could have integration, JavaScript, view tests, web service tests, and of course the UI based tests that you have. It really depends, the type of test depends on what the product really offers and is possible in order to be done. Okay? But on top of this, there is a big cloud or bubble of manual exploratory testing that is required, that is essential. And this together gives a sense of quality for the product. What is happening for the product? Is my product really good or you know, is it good health or not? Right? As a result, when you start moving from bottom to the top of the pyramid, there are certain things which happen. 
The cost keeps increasing, value keeps increasing, and the time keeps increasing. It's actually effort and value. Cost, effort, value, time. Right? What this means is the unit tests, which should be maximum in number, are the least expensive. Because you're taking, right, implementing those tests, running those tests against very granular pieces of code on the demo machine itself. You don't need anything else required to validate that functionality. So if you have a maximum coverage of these unit tests, you are going to get very quick feedback on what is your code basic logic working well. As now the code starts coming together, you would have integration tests, how different pieces of code work with each other, different classes, different components. If you have got a JavaScript layer to render richer UI uh, in the pages, for example, you would have JavaScript tests. You would have view tests in the workflow based applications. You don't want to go through 10 screens of that workflow to get to the level screen and test that one JavaScript uh, error message over there. You can use, uh, implement view tests which are using subs, mobs, whatever required to get directly to that level page of the workflow, validate that function, and you're done. It's quick feedback. And then at the end, uh, toward the end, you would have web service tests and UI tests. So what the pyramid doesn't really reflect very easily is the concept of an inverted pyramid in the background, which is what the impact of each test has on the product. So the unit test has the impact on the granular piece of the product. As you keep going up the pyramid, the impact of each test on the product keeps on increasing. As a result, what happens is my UI test, if I'm focusing on workflow validation, the level page of uh, the workflow validation, I have wasted my UI test in doing very specific validation. Whereas the impact of this test should really be at this level, I'm going across the breadth of the product, which potentially means across all integrations and integrated systems for that matter. That is the value that these tests provide. It is important to understand the value of each type of test, what it can have on the product. Okay? The other thing which the pyramid doesn't really indicate very well, which I've started using a lot of late, is the concept of technology facing test and the business case. So for example, you are seeing from a UI perspective or a UI implementation perspective, for some reason I want to change the radio button to a checkbox. Okay, these are that's a technology change, right? It's a UI uh, element change of sorts. I would do whatever form of testing required from a technology aspect to ensure if it's a change in the code logic, I will validate it here. If it's integration logic, I'll validate it here. Maybe it's just a view test in this case, nothing else is changing. So it might just be a JavaScript test and a view test to ensure that the correct behavior is seen from a UI aspect in that workflow. That's a technology facing test. But why is that change required? What is the impact of changing a radio button to a checkbox or uh, any other uh, such thing? Product owners, business owners, uh, they might have come up with that change for a specific reason. If we change this, it will help convert more people into using that functionality or getting to the next step. There is a valid reason behind that change why it has happened. That is a business side validation. What is the impact of that business side validation is what these tests should be validated. So if I spend time in doing a UI test, checking whether it's a checkbox or a radio button, I have lost value of that test again. What I should be checking over here is, what will happen if that one piece of UI element has changed? How is the user going to interact differently with my system? And can he get faster to the next step for example? With me so far? Yeah? What is the reality? How many of us use a test pyramid? Or adhere to the test pyramid? The reality is, there are two anti-patterns that I see. One is the ice cream cone anti-pattern. This is a test automation pyramid which is inverted. This is not the product under test anymore. They are the same type of unit tests, uh, sorry, same type of tests implemented. But because of the problems that we spoke about, too many UI tests, it doesn't work, various reasons why automation fails, as a result what happens, these tests become ineffective. And if the bulk of your tests are ineffective, what happens is you have to do more and more of manual experiment there. The typical ice cream cone. The lower part of this pyramid is a cone, and the ice cream is on top. 
Eventually, if you don't eat up the ice cream quickly, you don't reduce that, it's going to start melting, and eventually this cone is going to disappear. All you're left is with melted ice cream. That is only manual testing on the top. Okay? There's another anti pattern which I call the dual test pyramid anti pattern. Over here, there are two pyramids. Any idea what that might be? One is a developer's test pyramid, the other is a testing key test pyramid. Okay, you guessed that, right? You should speak up next time. You'll get brownie points, I don't have any other time this time. Why? Why would it be like this, sir? Okay, so the, the comment is the QA is probably not capable enough or skilled enough to be technical and contribute on the other side of things, right? No collaboration. No collaboration. But before we get to that, we have not spoken is the QA doing this or that anywhere over here, anywhere. That's a mindset that we have that the QA is going to be doing functional automation, the devs will be doing unit tests. How many of the QAs do uh, unit testing or white box testing? I have heard since yesterday a lot of things where devs write unit tests and white box testing uh, or API testing is done by QA. Why is QA required to do that? Why is a dev required to do unit testing? Why is a QA required to do only web service and uh, functional UI testing uh, for that matter? Or why can't the devs do that? We are not talking about roads anywhere over here. This is a team effort, is what is important, right? And that's exactly the uh, reason for this dual pyramid where there's a divide. We have created more walls between us. As a result of the walls, what happened? I don't know what is happening on the other side. I don't know if Mithun is speaking on the other side. He doesn't know what I'm speaking. As a result, he's talking about the same topic. I'm talking about the same topic. What happens? Duplication. Right? Even bigger problem than duplication of tests in this case is the potential of missing out on test cases or scenarios to be automated. Which is a bigger problem to have? Even if you miss out on one critical edge case scenario because of this lack of collaboration, that might cost the business millions of dollars, reputation or whatever else it might really mean. How many of us relate to which of the Patterns, pyramid, ice cream cone, or dual. Okay, raise, show of hands because we don't want to speak out. Hopefully, we can raise our hands better. A dual pyramid, raise hands. Okay, about 10 ish. Ice cream cone, raise hands. I'm not being judgmental, you can raise hands. No one is going to judge anyone. But that's the reality. We all know this is the reality. It's either going to be ice cream cone or dual pyramid. Very rarely do we get to a ideal pyramid state. Okay? So you need to reflect for yourself, for your team, where you are. And more importantly, out of that retrospection, is you need to see how can you get better. What is that better state? I'm not saying pyramid is a better state. Maybe in some context it is not. But you reflect, understand where you are, where you need to be, which is going to solve the organization objectives much more better, achieve the organization objectives better. If you don't care about that, quit your job. You are not doing the justice to your organization for that matter. Okay? And see how to get to that next step. It's always an evolving journey, an incremental journey. At times, you have to take two steps back in order to take a step forward eventually. Okay? Anyway, that's enough about the automation pyramid. We understand that well. Yes? Okay, so very good question. Why a pyramid? Why the division of labor of sorts? I don't think there's any division of labor. That's a conception, a mental model in our minds to say QA is going to be doing this, dev is going to be doing this, a performance engineering team is going to be doing this. We have created those walls in our minds. There's history for sure how it started off, right? 
but that is something that we have dug a hole for ourselves and we've got into it. And we don't want to get out of it. Okay? That's the easier answer to the second part. Why a pyramid? Very good question. I'm glad someone asked this. Pyramid is representation. Nowhere will you find. So pyramid by definition is what? What type of triangle? Equilateral triangle. Which means all sides are equal. Right? Does anywhere especially for those who raised hands, who knew about the pyramid. Does the pyramid anywhere talk about what's the ratio of test between UI, web service or whatever? Anyone has heard that? Yes. No? So it's a representational thing. It could very well be just, I just have a UI test and unit test, just two layers. So it becomes a very, very uh, small hybrid triangle, very wide at the base. Sorry? So I'll quickly go back. Over here, right? So all we are saying is if you are having maximum test closest to where you are making changes, you get the feedback quickest over there. It's all about how quickly do I know there is a problem with my code or with my system and how quickly can I adopt to those changes? You're preventing more and more. Yes. It's all about defect prevention versus detection, right? Why is this going to help? It's going to prevent defect. If a dev on an existing code base, legacy or not, an existing code base, if a dev has to go and make change from a checkbox to a radio button, for example, if there is a good coverage of tests, he or she or the team for that matter is going to know because of that change, did something else break as quickly as possible. So what happens is the, as you keep going up the test automation pyramid, the coverage of the product keeps increasing, right? In an enterprise application, how easy is it to set up an environment with a code base? In my earlier project that I was working on a core banking project, the build cycle was nine hours, very inefficient. To get that code deployed in some environment used to be minimum 24 hours for anyone to be able to see that change. If I and they did not have this. It was a typical ice cream cone. In fact, there was only ice cream, no cone also in some way. The only way I can validate a small change is I have to wait for a minimum of 24 hours. What value am I getting out? That's, that's what the pyramid really represents. Right? It's not about the ratios of saying that uh, this should be 5%, uh, this should be 70%. Uh, no. Only the team knows what the correct split should be. And only the team, including their QAs when they work together with all the different test cases, they will be able to come up with and say, this test is better automated at which layer of the pyramid. Okay? More questions on the pyramid? We can take it later as we have time or uh, post the uh, session. Because I really want to get to the crux of uh, the next part now. So we understand though what different pyramids can exist and what is the impact it can potentially have. Right? Continuous integration. We have all heard about it. We know what it means. Can anyone explain very quickly in 10 seconds? So, continuous integration that is what you said is more of a business side of resulting thing of what CI will achieve, right? But the crux is, yeah? Incremental development. Incremental development, right? A small line of change, has it affected anything or not? If a dev makes one line change and says, okay, my defect is fixed, has there anything else broken that we quickly find out? Is that one change? Typically, defect fixes act like that also, right? Oh, there was a typo and because of it, no, it was compiled error, no, for that, no, whatever it might. 
So continuous integration is implement the check in your code and run your build and test as often as possible to again get that feedback to the team as quickly as possible. How many of us have nightly builds or scheduled builds? How many of us, so that's a fair number of us, how many of us have actually CI set up for each check in? Probably less than one third the number of us. Okay. What value do you see from incremental uh, build process? Do you see a value? Would it make any difference if you move to a 90 bit cycle? You are not even thinking about time to market yet, right? But if there are 20 devs writing code, the feedback is so detailed. It saves time. If one check in has caused a problem, the dev, as soon as the check in is done, what is he going to do? Pick up another story or another functionality to implement, another effect to pick. Context switching happens. With context switching, there is a loss of productivity. Right? As a result of your first check in, you would do some other things beyond that, and you realize the first check in itself was wrong. You spent so much time doing meaningless work or redundant work. Potential. Okay? So the quicker feedback you get, the better it is. That's what continuous integration says. So if there are five different uh, teams or whatever developers who could be pairing or developing implementing, they would be doing their coding, taking it into a CI server, the tests run, the builds happen, the tests run on every check in basis. At times, there could be multiple check ins coming in at the same time while a build is in progress. Fair, those check ins are clubbed in together and run as part of the next cycle. Which is fair, absolutely right. But they are doing it on a con continuous phase. Okay? So, what is or what happens as a result of this when you are running tests on, on any continuous integration server? What do you look at from this CI server? Track, track what? In what form? Is the build green or not? Has the test passed or not? Which test passed or not for that matter? And then subsequent in, uh, integration uh, test or whatever else it might be. Right? So there are various different forms of dashboards that you can come up with if you look at the CI server. The sample example is from the Jenkins uh, CI server. I've run a bunch of tests and this is what the trending has been and this is what it looks like. And somehow you make meaning out of it. You have got build monitors maybe you uh, track it, oh, the build page immediately picks it, and then let's proceed. Does it work well? So, in your team, how many jobs are there? Which CI server do you use? Jenkins. How many jobs do you have in your CI server? Approx? More than 10, more than 20, more than 50, more than 100? Sorry? More than 100. How do you keep track of that? Do you go to individual jobs or you have grouped the jobs in some form of aggregation based on logical grouping? How many groups would be there out of those 100? At least 5, 10, 20? 30 groups? These all 30 groups are representing one product? Related to the same thing? So as a whole, you want to get a sense of quality for your whole product line for that matter. How would you know? You have to go through individual jobs or individual groups and try and make meaning out of it. How big is your team completely who is contributing to all these jobs? 50, 60. That's approximately the number I got from uh, one of our teams in Corpus also. About 50, 60 member team, they have more than 100 jobs. They use a different uh, CI server. We use both what works. Uh, Continuous delivery product. That's what we do. But it is difficult. With 50 people team, how many of us have the luxury of just a 50 person team? I'm saying just in no disrespect. It's an enterprise world. It is a different scale. How many of us have got more than 100 people in the team overall across the organization? More than 200? Or 150? Still a few minutes? So as that scale increases, aggregating these results becomes more and more of a challenge. All that you can look at is the overall aggregated status and anything more deeper you want to find out, you have to start digging in manually, trying to find a needle in the haystack. Fortunately, that haystack is clubbed together over here. Typically what would happen in enterprises, 
is with all these being spread out, you might have different CI servers for different product lines also for that matter. Not in the same CI server because it doesn't make sense. Maybe Jenkins scales up or maybe whichever CI server scales up. But it doesn't make sense to club it all together because they are sort of independent also. But eventually they all come together. Right? So this approach potentially works in smaller teams. Which are still distributed for that matter. It potentially works. But in larger teams, which are spread across the world in very complex environments, different time zones, how are you going to make that meaning out? So someone needs to say, okay, fine, if for these set of teams are just related to that product line, they are sharing a CI server. Likewise, there is another set of, set of product line which are doing the same thing. When a CIO, CTO, or some business head wants an aggregated report, someone has to manually do the hard work and get those consolidated reports out. How many people are dedicated to creating reports on a repeated basis? Has anyone done that? Been part of doing that? Know anyone who does that? Do they enjoy that work? So there are, on the comment is there are tools which do some uh, uh, analysis on these results and maybe identify patterns or what some what are out of it. Yes, most of these tools might be proprietary tools internally because you see these complex problems that build some custom solution out of it and they do something out of it. Do these tools cover all different types of automation or only functional? Mostly functional. What is the representation of quality? It's all the results that help in that, including manual exploratory testing results, right? Because that is very really valuable. How do you get all that together? Okay. So with that, very quickly, just talking about CD. That's the Nirvana state. How can I get from a build, which is good, to take it live or push it to the next stage of environment? How do I know about that? It's a very complex problem. What Martin Fowler says is that continuous delivery aims to make releases boring. To make releases boring is extremely difficult because you need to have so many practices implemented well to say at the click of a button when the dev checks in code, automatically my tests are going to run at some logical point I will run my manual, specifically identified manual regressions very quickly and then I will have the results out for the day. That is what is going to make it the releases boring. Everything is automated. I have all the dashboards ready in front of me with that combined results to say, am I good to go or not? And that would keep repeating because CD says you take a business idea, the smallest part of it, define it, deliver it, get feedback from the customers, incorporate the feedback, and keep on adding more features, keep on adding more value to that business idea. Okay? So Is your product ready to go to the next level? How would you know that? Small products, small projects, I'm not worried. Existing set of tools will be able to be make or will make that analysis easier. I'm not saying trivial, makes it easier. But with a larger scale, how do you know that? How do you know for sure how much of it is gut feel based, how much of it is data based? Are you okay to live with that gut feel based thing? I'm not saying that is not important, that is very important. Because for someone who's been testing it, I know for sure what is really happening. But I cannot substantiate that. How do you know that? Does all test passing mean no defects? I don't know how many of you have been following the Is TDD Dead series with Martin Fowler, DHH, and Kent Beck. If not, this uh, link from Martin's uh, blog, the video recordings for the hangouts are there. An extremely, extremely good series to watch, even for someone who is not hands-on programming for that matter. One of the things that Kent said, which was very, very nice, is about the notion of, does a green build mean there are no defects? If you are doing all the automation possible in your pyramid, does it mean there are no defects? Are the teams getting overconfident 
and arrogant in that sense to say my tests are passing there and only there. So he came up with a very simple thing. He said, maybe in a green build, we should have pixels of red scattered throughout to let the teams know there might be certain things we have missed out. Going back in time per se, but it's a reality check. We go from one extreme of no automation to the other extreme of only automation. Neither of it is going to solve the problem. It has to come together. That said, with these problems of trying to know how are you ready enough to go to get to the next level based on data points, I saw an opportunity, I had an idea, I came up with a concept called PDA, test and analyze. I want to do a quick demo of this. We'll be covering certain aspects from the demo. How we upload data, do some trend analysis, do some failure analysis, what admin features exist, and <coughs> about dashboards. Okay? Now this is the first time I'm doing a demo of this. So you know how demos usually work out, the success ratio. What I have done is TTA is running as it's built as a Ruby on Rails application. Right now it uses a MySQL uh, database as its backend. Is it scalable? Currently in its current state it is not. But it proves the concept. I'm just going to start it off. I've set up some seed data in it. And my server is running. Okay. This was built by grads with no UX UI experience, grad QAs for that matter. I have contributed to code a little bit, but mostly it has been ideation uh, has come from me. So ignore the look and feel of it. This is more about the concept and what value it can deliver. Okay. So the first thing is you need to get some data. One easy way, you go to the upload data where there's a bunch of information required that it uh, asks for as mandatory information. What's the project name, sub project name, CI job name, because you're uploading it manually, you enter that if you want, that is optional. Test category, this is important. Right now, I'm saying there are just three test categories. Unit, integration, functional. What type of test in the pyramid that you are representing? Test subcategory, so if I've selected functional, for example, I might say, oh, this is a part of my regression suite, smoke, sanity, whatever. How have I categorized those tests? Okay. The real important thing, though, is what type of reports is being generated by these tests. Is it a JUnit report that is generated? Is it Cucumber HTML reports that are generated? Is it JUnit, uh, NUnit based reports that are generated? And you would specify that. This is the crux of will TTA work for you or not? If your automation reports are not, automation results are not creating any of these supported formats, this will not work for you in the current way. But we'll talk about the next steps based uh, later on. And then you have some other metadata information, OS, the test ran on, the host machine name, browser if applicable, environment, whether it was a small dev environment, smoke environment, whichever environment, right? When did the test really execute? And then you give a zip file of the log directory where all the logs are consolidated, okay? So, though we'll be going through the architecture in more detail later, what we are saying is the tests have executed and then the results are coming to TTA. That's when the you'll start to be able to make some sense out of it, okay? So I'm not going to submit data, but I have some seed data already created over here. So we are going to look at that. So the first part is about Trend analysis. From our enterprise product, which is not a short product of three months, six months, nine months of sorts, it's more multi-year kind of thing, evolving product. I want to know what is the my ROI of automation for some uh, reasons. Not ROI from a monetary aspect. Am I? I've been, and I as a product manager or a business head, someone who's spending the money on uh, the teams and the tools, technologies. 
I've done so much. Has really the team automated enough tests? Has that been increasing over time? How do you really know that? CI will typically give you a limited uh, range of 30 days, 45 days, what is uh, you have executed. You typically would not archive those results forever or for a long time. Though disk is cheap, it is a lot of data to really keep and maintain. So one of the things that we are going to look at is, let's start with the most important thing from my perspective. How well am I conforming to the pyramid? So I would go to the pyramid view. I select a particular project. I say plot. This one does not have data. Let me pick up another one. Okay. But remember, this is a clunky UI. But what this is saying is, based on the test data that I have created, for that particular sub-project, whatever type of test data I have collected in ETA, all different types of test data, which includes unit integration functional, based on the latest test run, tell me if I'm, what type of pyramid am I? Now, pyramid by definition, as we spoke already, it's just a representation, it's an equilateral triangle. But what we are really looking for is, what is my spread of functional integration unit in this case? Clearly, I'm seeing in the background, this is what the ideal pyramid of sorts should look like. Again, representationally ideal. But we are seeing that I have 425 functional tests, 112 integration tests, 109 unit tests. The total time that it took to execute the functional test is about 2 hours, 27 minutes. Integration test, about 8 seconds. And unit test, is, in this case, is about 10 seconds. And the test uh, type split between all these categories and the passing percentage also. Is this right or wrong? Can anyone say? No one can say that. Neither can I. No, no one can say that except the team members whose tests these are. They know based on the product that is being tested is so many functional tests really required or not. If not, then let's do something about it. In one month's time or three months' time, let's try to make the consolidate the functional test reduce it to let's say 400. But in the same time, unit test should go up to at least 200. That's a plan only the teams can make who are working on those tests, who are working on that product. Okay? And there could be various such things. So the comment is, how can you know by the, how can you judge this based on the number of tests? That is a parameter on which we are judging the pyramid or basing the pyramid anyway. If you are saying it's 10 units as part of your functional, is that really one test or 10 tests that you are talking about? At functional level, when we look at the pyramid, the top layer, one test should be going across the breadth of the product, which means it's a user journey or a scenario of sorts. It's not a test case. Test case is granular functionality. The unit is a functional test which is doing the breadth of that coverage. So if I have one functional versus 10 unit, it may be right. In some cases, 10 functional and 10 unit is also right. Only the product determines what is possible or not. So this is giving you data points based on executions. And then the team members will come and say, okay, this makes sense or not. The tool doesn't make any judgments about it. This is right or wrong. It just says this is what it is. Okay? In a visual form, in a uh, real time form for that matter. Okay. The next thing is comparative analysis. Now, let's say I'm going to uh, ask you again. You've got so many types of tests automated and you're using CI. How do you know which teams are doing well or not on automation? over a period of time. If there is effort on uh, investment on automation, and if you want to see what is the automation results like over a period of time, for a specific project, and all types of tests and sub-projects and tests that might be part of it, I could just go to comparative analysis, you give a date range, select project, sub-project, 
I say plot over that period of time, I am seeing this representation. Okay, the view is not showing up properly on Chrome. This will probably be even worse, but let's try it out anyway. On a lower resolution, this becomes very weird. There's a Max Safari allows me to zoom out. Okay. I hope this is a little uh, visible. I won't spend time on the rendering part. But what it says is for all the different projects and sub projects that I have, the different types of tests inside it, over that time period, what is the pass percentage, uh, passing percentage versus uh, the number of tests uh, for the date range over there? So, over a period of time, I can say, okay, this green line over here, whatever this represents, is fairly consistent or inconsistent versus these other ones. There is just ups and downs over there. They are very flaky tests for whatever reason. So, you can immediately at an enterprise level or at a project level start making meaning and say what is the state of automation or the state of the product at that uh, for that particular team in its functionality. Each of the bubbles represent a specific test run time that has happened. That was one instance of the execution. And you can say okay if it was working for so long and then suddenly it went down for a couple of days or a couple of runs. Let me investigate on the first time when it went down and that helps me in my root cause analysis. In other cases, I might say, okay, there's just too much uh, peaks and dips. Maybe automation is not working well, that skill set might be wrong, the product might be flaky, whatever reasons. Let me investigate that team separately. What is happening? Maybe they need better skilled people or better tools over there. But it's giving you more data points from a holistic view to try and make meaning out of it. That's the comparative analysis. Yesterday we spoke in some ways about performance engineering or performance testing and how it is important to get that done as quickly as possible, uh, not wait for a special performance testing cycle. So one of the ways that I have seen really helped me a lot is in test execution trends. Whichever type of test you take, unit integration functional, if that test has been implemented and running uh, in a deterministic fashion, over a period of time, how has it been executing? So if I again say, I select a functional test from a date range again, and I select any particular test that I'm interested in, say submit, I can see that this test has been going all over the place. The minimal time is probably about one second or something, and at times it has taken 13 seconds to execute. Why is there so much deviation for the same test to execute? If the test has been implemented and running well, that functionality is done, what is happening here? What you would typically see is a straight horizontal line or some form of linear growth to say that yes, maybe there is more functionality added over here or something has happened. But again, you are not waiting for a specific performance engineering cycle to kick in or performance testing cycle to kick in. Based on whatever type of test, you can see what the execution trend has been like over a time period and see are there any anomalies in that and if yes you could very quickly say okay which one do I want to investigate why is it going up from here all the way over here is it based on a particular time you know, when the test is run maybe it's an integration point that you are cutting across which might be delayed for whatever reason at that particular time you can try and do that root cause analysis much more quickly okay this is in terms of the trend analysis and the value it will help the team leads, managers or whoever to take a holistic view about what the product is doing or set of products are doing and try and make some meaning out of it and help in root cause analysis at the right point in time. The other things which are more important from a team member perspective I would say is a failure analysis. So if I have got 1000 tests running as part of my CI, 100 of them are failing and 100 have been failing consistently yesterday, today or last week also. How do you know the same 100 tests have been failing throughout? You are just looking at percentages or numbers from CI to say what is happening. 
the number of tests that are failing. What is really important to know is which tests are failing, has there really been any difference in that? And that's where compare runs really help to say, I pick up whatever thing that I'm really interested in, pick up any type of test execution, pick up any two runs that I'm interested in. So let's say the most recent two runs. And I plot it out. Again, a very clunky view uh, in a table format, but this gives me two types of, uh, four types of information. Which tests have been passing consistently in both the runs? Which tests have been failing consistently in both the runs? These tests I probably do not care enough about. Which have been failing consistently, maybe it's a known defect, we find the defect, whatever, it will be fixed. What is more important to me is which test failed yesterday but passed today. That is valuable to me. I know something has been fixed. More importantly, the most important information is which test passed yesterday but failed today. The number of tests failing might remain consistent. So I'm happy some tests started passing today, but something has failed today. Something new has failed today. Maybe it's a regression. I know which test I can focus on to find out more about it. I don't have to dig through all those different jobs and groups of jobs and get that information. I can get it in a much more realistic and quick format directly. It will help my root cause analysis become much more quicker. Out of those, let's say you know you've got 100 failing tests today. Are they failing for the same reason? How many reasons could be there that they are failing for? There could be 100 different reasons for each of them or it is quite possible that 30 of those are failing for the same reason. The remaining 70 have got 10 different reasons why it's failing in whatever combination. So where do you need to focus your energy on in terms of fixing the issues or fixing the tests for that matter, right? It's quite possible that tests are outdated. So you could go to failure analysis and again, and pick up a specific curtain Over here, the dates which do not have test run, they are grayed out. So you could select any one that you are interested in. Which run you are interested in analyzing because there could be multiple test runs on the same day. And over here, I see there are a lot of failing tests, but 32% of the tests are failing for the same reason. 2.6% tests are failing for this other reason, whatever that reason might be and so on. So I know if I fix the problem, which is causing 32% test failures, what is going to happen with my test percentage? Potentially with one fix, 32% tests are going to start passing. Bang for the buck, 80-20 rule, right? Just three moments, okay? That's failure analysis. Last thing from the demo perspective is all the set of tools that we use, they all have value. You take CI, it has still got really important information from the dashboard perspective or any other test management tool that you might have or whatever tools you have, they've got good dashboards and information. TTA doesn't aim at replacing any of those. But at the same time, you need to get a unified view of all tools and dashboards in one place, which will help make your navigation and decisions easier. So the Another view that we have over here is an external dashboard view where I can add external dashboards inside TTA and then when I go to the home page, they will be linked over here and I can see, I can navigate, I can see whatever is required inside that. This has become a recursive loop now because I don't have net connectivity. I could very easily link it with Jira or CI or whatever is there. So now from one place, I've got access to all the information I need to make meaning about what is happening in the product. This is very more powerful because what makes teams successful is transparency and building trust. If it is all out over there, it's never about why is your test failing? Oh, his, this manager or this person is picking on me. No. That person would be doing the same for anyone else. In fact, you can ask the other person, why is your test failing today? Yesterday it was passing. It's available to everyone. Okay. So 
quickly getting into the last stage of the demo. As soon as I can figure out how to get there again. Yeah. Yeah. How can you use TTA? This is available as a Thoughtworks uh, copyright, but it is available on GitHub as an open source product. First thing, as I mentioned, what you could do is download it, set it up as a Ruby on Rails project. There are instructions on uh, GitHub Wiki. Set it up. First thing you want to do is try doing a manual upload and ensure that it works for your type of test execution reports. If not, contact me. I will work with you uh, to support that kind of report and then you can continue using it. Once that has happened, how does it really work? Manual upload is a one time thing. Typically, what you want is every time the test run, you want to send your results to TTA, which will start storing those results and you can start making reports out of it, meaningful information. CI integration, we know how it works. When a job run uh, is triggered, the test run. The test when they run, it goes to a specific machine or agent where a set of things happen. You clean, compile, set up, run, test, and return uh, the results to CI, right? In terms of TTA integration, the only difference is instead of going from after running test to CI, you're going to send results to TTA first and then return to CI. That's the only difference. Why does this become really powerful? It's because you can now use any CI server that you have existing. You can have any build tool that you are using, and we will build a main break or whatever else around it. Your test can really be implemented using any test runner and programming language. The only difference is your build file needs to be modified to send results to TTA. So it's very decoupled from your technology stack, and you can start using it. Okay, you have. There are a bunch of features that I already have in mind that I need to add. For sure, it's UX, responsive webs, alerts of various different forms, uh, then email reminders of printing the reports to PDF and sending it out. Various such things I already have in the backlog. I work on this as and when I get chance. Uh, it's not my primary responsibility. But at the same time, you could be suggesting features, what might be valuable to you. More importantly, you could be contributing to uh, implementing those features. Remember, it's open source. Everyone can contribute. And that way we can make the product better for everyone because it's generic, it's not tied to any organization in that way. As long as quality is maintained about this, we'll all will be able to make use of it. Use it and provide feedback. Feedback is most essential. Like I'm going to ask you now for at the end of my talk, would you have any feedback for me? Okay. So with that, I would like to conclude uh, this particular conversation very open to hearing more thoughts, questions around it. I'll be around till late today also for that matter. The contact information is here. Please feel free to reach out to me for more information on how to use it or any other different thoughts, ideas that you might have. I'm looking forward to take this further. Thanks. Uh, Nitesh, I don't know if you have time for questions or not.